Yeah, just casually dropping two, three gigabytes per second over the network. That's what the Synology SA3400D, dual controller. It's basically table stakes at this point to get a Windows machine to talk to the network at 25 gigabit, which is kind of mind blowing that we've come that far. It doesn't need a special network or different packet sizes or anything like that. It's basically plug and play. Let me show you how with this Synology NAS. Is it really a NAS? It's enterprise grade. It's, it's different than other NASs. Let's take a closer look. That's practically portable. SA3400D, D for dual controller. That's pretty obvious when you look at the back. There's two sets of ports for everything. This is one of the Xeon D compute modules, basically a computer. Inside, you can see that we've got four DDR4 DIMM slots for ECC U DIMMs. That's unregistered error correcting memory. In the base configuration, you've got eight gigabytes per node in a single DIMM, which is surprisingly capable for storage applications. I've also added the Synology 25 gigabit dual port NIC. So two 25 gig connections, a total of 50 gig. In addition, each one of these has a single 10 gig port and dual one gig ports. <laughs> we'll talk more about those in a second because you can do creative uses. So this single node has five connections to the network. You can see here we have our SATA disk on module. So there's a little bit of local storage here, but this isn't really directly user accessible. This is really just for configuration and Synology stuff. We've got our serial attached SCSI interfaces here. And there is one extra SAS port at the rear for connecting a disk ex expansion shelf. So each one of these nodes has that connection. There's also an RS-232 serial port because everything enterprise has to have an RS-232 serial port, right? And that's pretty much it, right? We've got our tiny little Xeon D processor in the middle here, but uh, like I say, it is a surprisingly capable platform. Right now I'm using the Keoxia PM7 SAS flash disks. These are not on the Synology QVL at the time that I'm recording this verified vendor list, but check that from Synology. And if you'd like to see these drives added, Synology is adding non-Synology drives to the quality control list. There's a little bit of a controversy, a kerfuffle, if you will, because Synology has Synology branded drives. And some folks were saying, well, wait a minute, if you only can use Synology branded drives in the Synology platform, suddenly this isn't as good of a deal because I can't just go out and buy Samsung drives. Well, that's not the case with the SA3400D. You can buy non-Synology Samsung drives. They're just drives that should be tested, like the PM1643. The 1633, I tested that. That's not on the QVL, and so you get a warning. It works anyway, but you do get a warning. Whereas the 1643 has no warning and works anyway. Everything is green across the board, even though that is not a Synology drive. It's very important to understand this. You know, credit where credit is due. Don't you know, venture spleen because it's like, oh, it doesn't work with a Synology drive. No, it totally does. It even works with people that are doing stuff way off in left field like me, but this is a good serial attached SCSI drive. Incidentally, serial attached SCSI SAS is part of the magic of how Synology does this. You see, you've, you've really only got three options for kinds of drives. You can do SATA, you can do serial attached SCSI, and you can do NVMe. And <laughs> Coincidentally enough, this is arranged in also the performance class. SATA tops out at about 600 megabytes per second. The Keoxia drives, those are SAS 24. So that's 24 gigabit. And it's pretty fast on a per drive basis. And then you've got NVMe, which for PCIe Gen 4 is eight gigabytes per second or 32 gigabit. Electrically, there is actually a fair bit of difference between SATA and SAS. A lot of people are aware that you can use a SATA drive with a SAS controller, meaning that on most Synology stuff, you can plug a SATA disk in and it'll work and that sort of stuff. The difference is that serial attached SCSI as a connector and standard can have what's called dual porting, which means that there's two different connections on this connector that can go to two different controllers. You see where this is going? You got your serial attached SCSI drives that can have two connections to two machines. And that's how this chassis works. That's how they do it at a relatively low cost. 
NVMe, for their part, there are some chassis out there that will take the four PCIe lanes that this supports and split it into two ports of two lanes. Uh, that's not widely actually standardized. It's kind of sort of standardized, but not exactly. I've got some Intel Optane drives that do that, but nobody ever really figured out how to do dual porting correctly with NVMe. Instead, what the industry does now is they do even lower cost equipment, but you just have physically more of it. So you have a very low cost chassis that has practically no redundancy in the same chassis, but you have multiple copies basically of that chassis. What that means is that if you wanted 12 drives of PM7 storage, you would actually have to buy 24 drives. You could configure it as you know, RAID 6 or RAID 5 or whatever in this individual chassis, and then the entire chassis is mirrored somewhere else. And when you do that, all you really need is a high-speed network interconnect between those devices. Well, it, it, the world isn't entirely ready to embrace that model, and serial attached SCSI being used to support dual connections to two different controllers is still a pretty common thing, especially at the middle of the market. And so this is, as far as network attached storage goes, at the highest end, and the serial attached SCSI interface all the way down to the drive is how they provide a redundant physical connection to each drive on two different machines. Each one of the 12 drives in this chassis is physically connected to both machines. And serial attached SCSI is smart enough that one machine or the other machine can take over control of the drive. So there is some coordination that happens there at the hardware level with serial attached SCSI. This chassis also has dual redundant 80 plus bronze power supplies which are a mere 500 watts each. Now, what about Seagate dual actuator hard drives? Nope, not compatible with this chassis. The dual path nature of SAS means that you really do need both paths for redundancy. So dual actuator hard drive is not gonna work here. You can use mechanical hard drives, but they also have to be SAS drives. They cannot be SATA. No SATA devices in this chassis at all. And of course, Synology supports using flash and spinning rust in the same chassis. If it were me, I would probably put all flash in this chassis or pick up one of the Synology chassis that does flash natively and then use the spinning rust through an external SAS shelf. But for this configuration, basically it's okay. If you wanted to add a more traditional NAS, one like this, this is the XS18 Plus that we reviewed previously. This one also supports a 25 gig NIC and will run well with the 25 gig NIC, but it doesn't run as well as their Xeon D platform. And this is because this is much lower cost platform and a lot of details like that. This type of a NAS platform also generally will work fine with SATA hard drives, whereas this requires SAS because you need the dual porting. If you wanted to do high availability with a regular NAS like this, as opposed to the 3400D, you're gonna need two of these. Two of these with the full drives and identical configuration in both of them, ideally. And then, yeah, you could still do high availability, but isn't the 3400D just a better package? Isn't that obvious? Now, in terms of iSCSI performance with VMware, I was shocked at how fast this platform is. Uh, against an older Dell 3020, this thing runs circles around a Dell 3020. A 3020 should have more hardware acceleration than a Xeon D. And yet, here we are. This is uh, the superior platform in terms of base performance. I can't get super detailed with uh, the VMware benchmarks because VMware has a thing in their EULA where you let them review the benchmarks and the, the guy that I had to review the benchmarks and approve them for a video isn't with VMware anymore. Probably because of the Broadcom acquisition, but I could speak in generalities. And generally, the VMware performance on this is very good. Synology works diligently for their VMware certification and it shows. Hyper-V also very, very good performance. This is uh, basically a no-brainer when we're talking about 25 gigabit Ethernet. I was kind of joking in the beginning when I said 25 gig is table stakes, but look, if you do anything that you need a high performance network for, like video editing or something like that, the test system I was using, it's a 32 core Threadripper. I basically plugged in a Mellanox Connect X4, which is old news at this point. A Connect X4 is an ancient 25 gig card. There are probably better choices on the market. Ancient Connect X4, plugged into a Dell switch, which is running an open source operating system, which I've previously done videos on. Uh, those are a little more expensive now than they were when I did the video, partly because of 
it's a whole story about Dell trying to take control of their switches by having a proprietary subscription-based operating system and then that backfiring catastrophically on them. And then, <laughs> and then they were like, well, okay, I guess everybody can have an operating system for their switches. 25 gig Ethernet, kind of expensive when you're buying a switch. Okay, that's, that's granted. You know, this platform starting at $10,000 and then you have to buy storage on top of that. But if you have priced out a storage device to do live video editing with reasonable latency that can run at over two gigabytes per second with Windows as regular file share, not even iSCSI, uh, this is a good deal, which is kind of impressive. Now, if you do choose to add more memory, it'll always use the more memory for cache as like a read cache. So that's nice, but it does also open up the other possibilities for virtualization and everything else, which we'll talk more about in a second. The last thing that I like about this hardware configuration is that it does recover from unusual uh, happenings pretty regularly. Popping a power supply out, popping a drive out, pro popping an entire controller out, it fails over pretty well. The way that it shows up on your network is each one of these controllers has a dedicated specific IP address, but then there's a third IP address that is shared between the two of them. And so either one of these nodes can take over for that IP address, but if you need to for monitoring or logging or error reporting or whatever kind of telemetry system you have, you can always be guaranteed that you're connecting to controller A or controller B by specific IP address, but then the shared IP address can be whichever controller is able to service the request. That's how they deal with it on the network side. And that's true of all of the interfaces. So like if you did run a forbidden router style VM, those are fun, interesting videos, you should check those out then you can make the one gig ports dedicated for the LAN and WAN side of your you know, forbidden router. Or you can use your 25 gig interfaces for the LAN side and one or both of your one gig interfaces for say the WAN side, the internet side and the DMZ. But you're gonna have to connect both of them to a switch and then your modem to a switch as well. This isn't a problem if you have an enterprise grade connection, but if you have, you know, like a cable modem or something like that in your small business, it can be a little tricky to set it up that way. You may have some hoops that you have to jump through in terms of uh, MAC address setting and things like that, a little outside the scope of this video, but it is entirely possible to run PFSense or OpenSense in a VM on this hardware and have hardware failover, which is pretty awesome. It works a little differently than high availability works inside PFSense and OpenSense. That's, there's some pros and cons with that approach, but again, for the scope of this video, if you really wonder about that or something you're seriously considering building on, you know, come to the forum, show, show us pictures, tell us what your use case is, because this is what the level one community is all about. And who knows, maybe it'll end up being the basis of a future video. I don't know. I was also pleasantly surprised by how competent the dual 25 gig platform is from Synology for their own NASAs it really wouldn't be a terrible idea to run Synology's 25 gig network cards in the client as well. There, there are Windows drivers. It's a, it's a pretty well supported chipset, the fast action chipset. And uh, in this world of uh, Broadcom uncertainty and some uh, and an alarming number of threads on the level one forums about Intel's 25 gig networking options. Well, these seem to hold up pretty good in native Linux, in Synology and on our Twitter for workstation. So, neat. Now, setting up a Windows share is pretty easy. There's file manager, but there's also configuration options. Like you can set SMB multi-channel, which will allow you to have multiple connections from your client workstations to the server transparently in order to handle faster transfers. There's really no downside from turning it on. It's off by default because uh, it's not really, I don't want to call it a new feature, but it's not as well tested as off. So, but SMB multi-channel is something we've covered in the past. And if you're curious about what exactly that is, some of our really ancient videos at this point go uh, pretty in-depth into SMB multi-channel, but it's just a Windows file share thing. But beyond Windows file sharing, there's also iSCSI. And this is one of the easiest iSCSI setups that you can have on a Windows system. Now, if you just next, next, next through the wizard, it actually doesn't set up authentication when you configure iSCSI by default, but you can set that. Uh, and so the first machine that comes along will grab a hold of the disk. But even on our Windows 11 client here, it still has iSCSI built in. Uh, Windows really weirds me out with the control panel stuff where they're like, oh, let's change the way the control panel works and make everything Fisher Price. And I don't see them making a Fisher Price version of the iSCSI interface, which really 
worries me in terms of future ICIZ support for client operating systems. But as of right now today, in the you know first half of 2024 version of Windows 11, it's there. And if we run Crystal Disk Mark on it, we see that we actually have pretty reasonable performance. This performs like a first generation PCI Express 3 in VME, albeit with a little bit worse latency. So like SATA-like latencies with NVMe levels of throughput, this isn't bad. And this iSCSI interface is also similar to what you would experience with VMware, which I've also been testing, and Hyper-V. Yup, testing that one too. I've had this thing for a while. If you're into NFS, the software supports NFS, you can configure that. Even AFP, the Apple File Protocol, even Apple doesn't want to support you there. They really don't. You can also run a native FTP server or an rsync service. Definitely do not recommend that for the internet, but in a LAN context, okay, maybe it sort of kind of makes sense. Even though this is a high availability platform in and of itself, it also supports a Synology high availability, meaning that you can do another layer of replication. This box could replicate to an inexpensive box filled with mechanical hard drives. I mean, our SSD configuration here is super over the top nice, but if you just need an extra replica backup, Heck, you could do that with three or four 20 terabyte hard drives just to have another replica on another Synology NAS box. It doesn't have to be rack mount. It could be a much more inexpensive platform just to have another replica. You get that. But Synology's whole software ecosystem has a lot of stuff in it other than active backup for business and the client software that will help you back up your client workstations like Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. And you can see that here in the package center. I mean, you could deploy McAfee antivirus directly on your, on your NAS. Don't do that. And a document viewer, you can run DHCP, you can run DNS, you can run PyHole, you can run Docker and Virtual Machine Manager and Apache. There's tons of contributed packages for this that are just a point and click install away. Now, on the base configuration that has eight gigabytes of memory, really would not recommend that you go completely crazy because the more memory that you use for those background services, the less you're going to have available for file services. But the good news is adding 32 or 64 gigabytes of memory per node, it's pretty straightforward. If you do elect to get more memory, I would recommend that you take one of the DIMMs out of one of the controllers and put it with the other controller so there's a matched pair there. And then you can get another 16 gigabytes of unregistered ECC memory, put that in the other node, and you get two nodes with 16 gigs, and that is more than enough to run Pi-hole or a forbidden router. We'll talk more about that. The other really popular software application for this is Surveillance Station. Think about what high availability gives you if you want uh, a surveillance station that is always up. Whenever this thing has to be updated for software updates or new features in your surveillance software, no problem. You just hit a button to install the update and all of the surveillance stuff moves over from the primary node to the backup node seamlessly and transparently. So as this thing is going through updates or anything like that, you're rotating which half of the machine you're actually running on, which connection to the disks you're actually running on. And in so doing, you're never down. So it's like, oh, it takes 10 minutes to install an update or 30 minutes to install an update. The cameras are recording continuously because you are updating the two different nodes at two different times, you know, an hour or two apart or whatever that looks like. So high availability really gives you some interesting options. Synology has also begun to offer a lot of cloud-based services like C2 Backup, and they'll also offer remote access to your Synology through their security infrastructure. If you prefer to use your own infrastructure, there's a lot of uh, VPN self-hosting stuff that you can do. There's a VPN server that you can install on your Synology. You can also use it with third-party services like Tailscale. Tailscale is one of the few third-party services that I actually would recommend, and the Tailscale client for Synology is basically top shelf. It's got a couple of quirks when you're using the Synology as a uh, an exit node endpoint. Like you, whenever the Synology reboots or there's a software update, you have to rerun a script from the SSH connection. But other than that, it's basically a first class experience. If you just need it on your Tailnet and you need to be able to access it remotely through Tailscale, that works out of the box consistently reliably. It's only the exit node stuff where it gets a little squirrely. And there's also a virtual machine manager. Yeah, this is Xeon D. You can run virtual machines right here. Now keep in mind, you don't have a ton of cores and out of the box, you don't have a ton of memory to run virtual machines. You can always add more memory. But for running virtual machines, you can run some small virtual machines like Pi-hole or the forbidden router. So remember in my configuration, dual 25 gigabit ethernet, that means that we're not using our onboard one and 10 gig network ports. Can you run OpenSense or PFSense as a virtualized router and configure those hardwired ports on your Synology to not offer Synology services, but to be passed through 
to the virtual machine so that you can use that as a router that has high availability. Yes, you absolutely can. This is not really an officially supported way of running these particular pieces of software. So don't expect, you know, officially licensed sanction support, even if you're paying for, you know, the pay for version of PFSense. But it does work pretty well. And that's one of the things that I was testing over the last couple of months. It's very easy and straightforward to set that up. You can check out the guide in the level one forms. Maybe we can do a separate video if you have problems with it, but it's very, very straightforward. Basically, you just say, hey, this physical interface maps to the WAN port. This physical interface maps to the LAN port. I'm good to go. You can also do VLANs, but the VLAN GUI in Synology, in my opinion, is not as easy to use as just using physical interfaces. So this setup where I've got 25 gig Ethernet, I kind of do like the idea of taking the uh, 10 gig in and out for my fiber optic connection from an ISP. And so it's like, oh, dual 10 gig, dual 10 gig on both ports, VLAN connected to a switch. Basically, we're fine. And that's been a quick look at the Synology SA3400D. D for dual controller. And that's really what you're paying for. The uh, MSRP list price of this thing, again, it's about $10,000 US before you add drives. But the fact that you've got dual connections to each one of those SAS drives means that you don't have to buy two sets of drives to have two cabinets replicating between one another. Or at least if you do decide to do two cabinets replicating, you can have one that's high performance and another one that's just mechanical hard drives. So uh, cost savings there. For my configuration, pure SSDs, the Synology recommended list includes Synology drives, but there are also non-Synology drives like Seagate 1643 will work without any complaints from the Synology interface. I also tested the older 1633s, they work fine, but Synology software complains that they have not been tested, as well as our modern Keoxia SAS drives. And these Keoxia SAS drives are great if you have older hardware or you just want to drop in into an existing SAS infrastructure. These are brand new SAS drives, great performance. This is a great option. SAS cleverly used here means that you've got high availability without break, breaking the bank in terms of like, oh, I have to buy two redundant sets of drives because that's kind of how we're doing things in the enterprise. This is a good option if you need the high availability. And for things that have this level of high availability, the price is actually pretty reasonable. So I get why Synology has this product. I'm with us at Level 1. I'm signing out. You can find me in the Level 1 forums.